We are about to jump into this word um, where I'm going to be doing part one of this sermon this morning. Uh, I'm going to be doing part two this evening. And so for all of y'all who wanted a whole word, I see you back this evening. The mocktails, mocktails, not cocktails. It won't be no communion juice for you. <laughs> but um, doing part one this morning, I'm excited to share this word. Uh, how many of us are excited to go into a new year? Yeah. I pray that it's full of joy and peace. Uh, I will say that I pray that it's free of chaos, but I know God uses chaos sometimes. But if you have the joy of the Lord and the peace of the Lord, the chaos will continue to construct what God wants to do in your life and not tear it down. So I do pray joy and peace, but that might not be free of dilemma and chaos, but I trust that the Lord can be with you. Are we ready for a word this morning? Yes. <clears throat> we know participation is better than what? Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and I'm coming out of the New King James Version. If you know anything about me, you know this is my favorite, my favorite version of the Bible, um, the New King James Version. Let us read together. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I want to go back to verse 3. That's going to be my focal point um, this morning. Verse 3 it says, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, Neighbor, in 2024, I'm putting my foot down. Come on, look at somebody else. Tell them, I'm putting my foot down. Hey, Amen. You may be seated. I'm putting my foot down. Amen. Somewhere between this sermon and the next sermon, I'm going to cover these things right here. Release the old. Remember the promise. Reclaim your courage and remain faithful. This is how you put your foot down. You got to release, remember, reclaim, and remain. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. And now, God, as we engage in your word, we believe your word is living. We believe it is powerful. We believe it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray now, Lord, even now, God, as we are in this moment, Lord, that you will speak to us, give us wisdom from on high. Lord, help us become who you called us to be and do what you called us to do for your glory. Father, I also pray now, God, in this moment, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
put your foot down. How many of us have heard that term before? The basic term meaning I ain't taking it no more. I'm putting my foot down. I am, I am now, gonna, I'm now going to convey my authority. One of the things we've been working on in our parenting journey, uh, hopefully you all know that parenting is a dual discipleship process. Uh, you're discipling the children, and the children are reminding you where you need to be discipled. I thought the parents would say amen. Y'all, amen. y'all got quiet on me already. And one of the things we've been practicing is we want our children to uh, obey when we say. Yeah, the way they say obey right away. So when I say it's time to put the tablet down, it's not wait. It's right now. Now, here's the thing. As a good husband, my children have a mother, but I have a wife before they got a mother. I just... Okay, thank you. All right, I'm seeing some men shake their head. In other words, what I'm saying is, yes, my wife is their mother, but she's my wife first. Amen. Got it? So when, my, when their mother communicates something to them and they don't respond to my wife the right way. Y'all, y'all follow me now. Now I have to communicate something to them. What did she say? And why are we talking? I need you to do less moving of your lips and more moving with your feet. In other words, I'm putting my foot down. And, it's, and you know, when you think about putting your foot down, there's a certain sound when you stomp down. It's supposed to cause the soul to shudder and pay attention. As I think about this phraseology, I'm putting my foot down. Every now and then, you can give people grace for a moment of time. You know, I don't know if you've ever been around people that keep on poking you, trying to see how you're going to respond. And then at one point, you draw a line in the sand and say, look, you got one more time. You got one more time before I'm going to lay my hands on you. Sometimes you can deal with people saying certain things about you, and you turn in the other cheek. And probably about the 15th time you turned around, you said, look, you better not be there this time. Because there's something, when we say the phrase, I'm putting my foot down, we're saying the buck stops here. I'm not taking it anymore. As we come to the end of the year, there's some things that's been going on in your life. There's been some struggles, some situations, some challenges, some circumstances, some internal mindsets that you've, that you've been dealing with. And the fact of the matter is, you're ready for it to stop. Can I get an amen from somebody? You ready for it to stop. And this is your way that I'm speaking to you today. That you can walk in the authority that God has for you. And maybe you can make this statement, not for anybody else, but just for you. That you're not giving up any more ground to Satan or his plots or his schemes. And on this moment, on this New Year's Eve, as you go into the next year, you're going to make a faith declaration. I'm putting my foot down by faith. In the authority that the Lord Jesus has given me. As I look at this idea of putting my foot down, it's meant for us to walk in a level of authority. Now, I'm going to be fully transparent with you uh, as we come to this New Year's Eve moment. uh, That the message I'm sharing with you is the message the Lord is preaching to me for myself for 2024. So y'all just get a chance to overhear the conversation of how the Lord edifies and sometimes rebukes me. So don't think the preacher just talking to you. In other words, when I begin to look at 2024, I have to look back at the, at the previous years. And, and what I realized that there are some things and some places in my life that I've given up territory that I was never supposed to give up. There are some things I, I started thinking different. I started thinking by fact and not by faith. There are some places where hurt, trauma, or either broken relationships, or either things that where my expectations were let down, where I begin to find myself in this place where I've given up things that I'm not supposed to give up. Um, and can you do me a quick favor? Turn me down to the monitors just a little bit. And when I get to this place, when I'm looking in, coming into 2024, what I began to realize was this is a year where the Lord is saying, Chris, I need you to walk in the authority that I have given you. Now, if that word fits you in any way, you can take my name out and put your name in there. 
because the authority that the Lord has for us is from him and should not be taken by anybody except for him. As I look at it, as we come in in year 12 of the church, uh, we'll be celebrating 12 years in February. Me and my wife are in the 12th year of our marriage. You could say that the first year of our marriage, we got married and we planted a church and then also found out we was pregnant. You could just say that first year was busy. Yes, it was. It was stressful. I had a whole head of hair. Sure did. Yep. And by the time the next baby came around, I was on my Tupac Shakur. Should I say my George Foreman? But as I looked at the 12th year of our marriage, as I looked at the 12th year of this church, 12 in biblical numerology is the number of authority. And I began to recognize that there are some things and some places that the Lord was saying, Chris, the authority is not a question if you have authority. The question is, will you walk in it? Y'all see the difference. Sometimes we've been questioning if we have authority. As a child of God, and, and, I, and I promise you, this is not, this is this sermon is today, but you got to listen to all the sermons in December because when you think about the second Sunday of December, as we talked about in John chapter 1, verse 2, and it says, all who believe, I mean, yeah, verse 4, all who believe have been given the right to be called children, of, to become children of God, that we have a right in Christ to have the authority of Christ that rules us, governs us, and also that we can walk in. And some of us are questioning the wrong thing. It's like we're spending too much time in the wrong part of the conversation. And now when I get to this place, I'm like, the question isn't if I have authority. The question is, will I walk in it? So let me give you some context for this content in Joshua chapter 1. I know many people know about Joshua chapter 1, and a lot of times people just jump to the main phrases that happens over and over again. Be strong and courageous. Only be strong and very courageous. Be strong and very courageous. And, and, we, and we got that, that God was telling Joshua, be strong and courageous. But then the, questions I, the question I have to ask is, why was he telling him this? And what was happening when he was telling him this? And verse 1 comes and it gives me the chance to see that this is a new year transition, a new season transition for Joshua, verse 1 of Joshua 1. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, uh, um, Moses' assistant, saying, and these are the words that the Lord speaks to Joshua. Hear this. This is, we get the context. But here, the first thing, Moses has is, Moses is passed away. The children of Israel are still in the wilderness. There's a promise yet to be claimed. And this is the first thing that the Lord says to Joshua. Moses, my servant, is dead. Y'all, y'all missed that? I knew y'all would miss it um, because y'all still got Christmas cookie hangover. Um, <laughs> Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, you got to get this because uh, when you understand the, the, the significance of this statement, is that God is telling Joshua, hey, the past is in the past. And I'm speaking to you in the present. Now, okay, maybe, maybe you, you, you didn't, see, you didn't walk with Moses. See, you weren't the one that was in slavery when Moses came in and said, let my people go. See, you weren't there when Moses raised his rod and the Red Sea parted. You wasn't there when Moses called out manna from heaven and water from a rock. And so you got to think, when you think about Moses' resume and his leadership shadow, that for God to tell Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead, my personal response is, what is we gonna do <laughs> Moses does not have small shoes to fill and sometimes you got to remember his resume Moses was once the prince of Egypt Moses spent time in Midian and came back Moses set a nation free Moses my servant is dead see the thing about transition into leadership or transition into a new season it's, it's, it's easier when the one before you was bad. <laughs> y'all, y'all. <laughs> right? All you got to do is just do better than the one that came before you. What they say, you don't have to be able to outrun a lion. You just got to be able to outrun the other zebra. Y- y'all missed it? Y'all out here trying to be fastest Sometimes you just got to be faster than the one that's slow. So when we come to the idea 
that if it was, you know, following up, you know, Saul, my servant, is dead. Yeah, about time. He was horrible anyway. I could be a better king than Saul, and I don't even speak the language. <laughs> Moses, my servant, is dead. See, when we come to these moments of moving from the old to the new, we often think we have to leave behind bad things. <sighs> yeah. See, we immediately think, I'm coming into this new year, and I got to get rid of all my bad stuff. But what if some of your good stuff is not meant for the next season? Oh, I'm messing with them now. Because sometimes we are so clinging to good that we can never become great. So Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, you got to understand, God spoke Moses' eulogy. What type of eulogy is this? Moses passed away. God said, let me, I got this. I don't want nobody else to say it. And he said, there has never been a prophet like him. There will never be another one. That's what God said about Moses. So when Joshua hears the first word, Moses, my servant, is dead, he has to hear some of our best days and the best leader we ever had as a nation is gone. Maybe as you come into this new year, maybe there is something that has been good that has carried you to where you are that might not be for where you're going. Yet it's hard to release something that's good in order to get to something that's great. Uh, and, I, and I know some of y'all are having a cognitive dissonant moment because uh, you're trying to figure out why is the pastor telling me to drop what's good to go to what's great. It's because some of us have grown complacency in yesterday's, grown complacent in yesterday's blessing when tomorrow supposed to have something greater. And you're going into the new year. Some of y'all just trying to be, I just want to make it. I'm speaking to some people who are tired of just surviving and are ready to go thriving. I want some people who don't just want the miracles that show signs to the promise, but want the actual promise. Uh, I'm talking about some people that said, look, I've been going good at a level seven, but I'm ready to go to a level 10. I know I've been all right, but I'm ready to go to another level. I know my marriage is not on fire, but I want my marriage to have some more fire. In other words, what I'm saying is, while you're experiencing something good does not mean God does not have something great. Great. Moses, my servant, is dead. Oh, man, it's a hard moment for, for Joshua to hear this. Uh, but yet, it's also a moment where as God makes this announcement, watch what God says to Joshua next. Um, um, when we look at Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 10 through 12, and it says, but since, then, uh, but since then there has not risen in, in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, and all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and in all his land, and by all, the, all that mighty power and the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of God, uh, in the sight of all of Israel. So we see God preaching Moses' eulogy, and, and then, God, then we see God speaking to Joshua and saying he's dead. And so when we go to Joshua chapter 1, verse 2, after he said, Moses, my servant, is dead, watch what he says. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan. You and all the people. Joshua 1, verse 2. It says, Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. And I, I love this because when I look at the verbs here, he says, Now because Moses is dead, because there was a good thing that has now passed away, uh, that has now, you got to move beyond. He says, This is what I need you to do. And so this could be an action word for some of y'all right here. Arise and what? Go. You got so he's saying you gotta get up and you got to go. When I heard that get up, I heard James Brown in the back of my head. Get up now, get on up, get on the scene now, get on up. <laughs> that thing hit me hard. Was, Happy New Year. Y'all ain't gonna hear me do that again. Not this year. <laughs> Maybe next year. <laughs> and so so he says, you gotta rise, like you gotta get up. 
Now, there's this element of transition. That's what I'm speaking to. The tension of transition. The tension of transition. You got to let something go in order to go further. And so he says, arise and, and, and go. So for some of you all, before I get to the end of part one of this message, is that your word is you just got to get up. You just got to, you have to make a, sometimes you have to make a conscious decision. When your mind doesn't want to get up, when your body doesn't want to get up, when your soul doesn't want to get up, what David said, I command my soul to bless the Lord. And so sometimes you got to make a faith declaration just to get up. Arise. And go over this Jordan. Now, I like this part, go over this Jordan, because that's the transition. Because they've been in the wilderness for 40 years. They've been in the wilderness for 40 years. The promise has already been existing. The question isn't if there's a promise. The question is, will they walk in it? The question isn't if there's a promise. And what God tells Joshua, uh, because Moses did not complete the task, he says, now the promise still stands. There are some things that the Lord has already spoken that are just waiting on you to arise and go. Go over this, Jordan. But this is what I like, too, because it wasn't just Joshua going over it. <laughs> um, arise, go over you and all this people. If you only try to have a better year for you, you're not going to care enough about you. Y'all hear me? I don't care enough about myself to eat healthy, to exercise. I care about my kids and their kids. So there are times I don't care enough about myself to do what's necessary. I got to have some people attached to me. They are, okay, arise you and all these people. That's what I'm preaching, you and all these people. In other words, there are other people who are waiting on you to go forward into the promises God has for you. Because as you walk in your promises, they also can walk in their promises. And so sometimes we have to be reminded, it's not just me. It may start with me, but it's not just me. And this is where we get the word legacy and, and faith that, that begins to rise up. And so when we look at this moment, Moses is dead and he tells him arise and go over the Jordan you and all these people he's saying now Joshua you have the leadership mantle you have the leadership mantle to go sometimes it's not until something has been removed and released that we can receive that we can have revelation and receive what God has for us it's not until something is removed and released you got to get both of them how many of us have clung to something that has already been removed? You've been broke up with the person, but you still think about them all the time. They have been removed, but they have not yet been released. There are some of us where there are, there are, there are things, there are people, there are relationships, there are, there are moments in our past that have been removed. Like the breakup has happened. You've been fired from the, I mean, I'm sorry, you, you retired from the job or you resigned from the job. Whatever, however you need to tell, however you need to tell your truth. Um, <laughs> and and, 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 and while, while that has been removed, you haven't released it yet. I'm talking to some people. That's allowing things from their past to live rent-free in their future. It's been removed, but you haven't released it. See, this is what you got to get to. it Because Joshua, while God removed Moses, that's what God did. Joshua has to release Moses. Because he has to recognize, I can't do it like Moses did it. I can't, and, some, and sometimes until you release what God already removed, you won't get the revelation that he has for you. Y'all need some scripture. Isaiah 6, Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and, the, and his train, the train of his robe filled the temple. It wasn't until King Uzziah died that Isaiah saw the Lord. King Uzziah wasn't a bad king. But understand, if King Uzziah is not removed, Isaiah does not get the revelation of the Lord. 
And then Isaiah does not go and preach the word and prophesy so we can celebrate Christmas and say unto us a child is born and a son is given. That if Isaiah does not get the revelation of the Lord, we don't get the word that Jesus will be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace will be upon him. If Isaiah does not get the revelation of the Lord, we don't get the revelation that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. If Isaiah does not get the revelation of the Lord, we don't get the revelation to expand our tent pegs. What I'm saying is one revelation begets other revelations. And until something is removed and released, you won't get the revelation that God has for you. All right, so, so, so hopefully y'all got that. If not, go back and rewatch it. <laughs> and so when I look at this moment, Joshua has to release Moses. Because remember, Joshua was Moses' assistant. He was his assistant. Which means wherever Moses went, Joshua went. Now, as his assistant, uh, Moses had all types of stuff going on. Like, this is the type of stuff that, that, that when I look at Joshua and his resume, Joshua, as Moses' assistant, one day, he has to get a whole army together and win a battle. Another day, he just got to sit in a tent and hear from the Lord. <laughs> what, type of, what type of internship is this? <laughs> on one day, I got to get people that ain't never fought before, that's been slaves all their life. And another day, I got to announce that the people that we done set free, they are they down here worshiping a golden calf. And so Joshua, as Moses' assistant, he has to recognize, I've seen Moses lead. I've seen Moses get mad. I've seen Moses do miracles. I've seen Moses do all of this. But I'm not Moses. <laughs> Maybe this year, the blessing you're going to have is when you announce who you are not. When you are not, I am not, and you can put in any descriptor or a person you compare yourself to. I am, not, you know who you are? You are who God made you. He made you unique. He made you different. And if God wanted another you, he would have gave you an identical twin and erased one of y'all when one of y'all messed up. Maybe coming into this year, you need to be okay with being Joshua and no longer Moses. It's not that Moses is bad. It's just that Moses is not you. And so, as I, let me keep going. Okay, so verse 2, he says, look, I want you to go over this Jordan. The Jordan, the Jordan is a, it's a river, and on one side, you're not in promise. On the other side, you are in promise. It's just the width of a river, but it's not the physical width that is the issue. It's the spiritual lack of faith that kept them from crossing the river. And so some of us, you're going to recognize that when you begin to look through the lens of faith, that who you are and who you want to be is actually not that far apart. Because faith is a perspective. Faith doesn't always change a situation. It might change how you view and understand the situation. Am I preaching to anybody in here? That maybe you're just a river away. And so when you hear, ain't no river wide enough, <laughs> you begin to hear on the other side of it, there is promises that God has for me, and not just for me, but for my children and my children's children, that on the other side, I just have to find the courage to cross the river. And so as I look at this, uh, later on in Joshua, because people still were peddling around in the wilderness. Could you imagine just walking around your promise? Just walk, not, not going in, though. No. Just, just walking around. <laughs> it's right there. You know what a nightmare is? A nightmare is when you can see the way of escape, but you're stuck in bondage. You know what a nightmare is? When you have a vision, but no plan. And so they walking around it. Joshua 18.3, the challenge came. Joshua 18.3 says, Then Joshua said to the children of Israel, How long will you neglect to go and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers have given you? How long will you neglect walking in the freedom, walking in the peace, walking in the joy? How long will you neglect? I 
I'm speaking to some people that's tired of standing on the outside looking in at their promise. You have been window shopping what God has spoken for you to walk in. And you think you just have to peruse it. But what I'm saying is you're supposed to possess it. How long will you neglect walking in it? How long will you neglect actually doing the necessary work to cross your metaphorical Jordan River and go into what God has promised you? The question isn't if there's a promise. The question is, will you walk in it? Now, as I look at this, I can't help but think about Joshua, uh, Joshua following Moses as Moses' assistant, right? Uh, did you? I, I miss this. I, I didn't see this before. But actually, Joshua had a name change. He had a name change. In, in, in Numbers 13, 16, uh, and when you look in the Hebrew, his name was Hoshea, Hoshea, which is salvation. But then, under Moses' leadership, his name change was Yeshua, which is where we get the Lord is salvation. That, that, that sometimes the name change might seem small, but it inserts the Lord into it. Hosea, salvation. But then when Joshua recognized, I'm not salvation, and the Lord is salvation, it took pressure off of him and put faith in God. As I look at this moment of what God is speaking to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, you got to get the context. Joshua was a slave for the first 40 years of his life and then lived another 40 years dislodged from a homeland in the wilderness. He was a slave for the first 40 years of his life and then lived another 40 years in the wilderness. Why, 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 why is that so important? He was a slave for the first 40 years, which means all of his understanding, his development as an adult, it was, it was, it was forged in bondage. But then he lived another 40 years in the wilderness, walking around the promise. So when we get to Joshua chapter 1, Joshua was about 80 years old. Ah, and he just now about to hit his stride. Okay, let me say it like this, because y'all, that was too deep, too much history. Uh, it's, it's not too late for you. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. It's not too late for you. If he can spend 40 years in slavery and 40 years in the wilderness and now begin to walk in who God called him to be on another level, it's not too late for you. And let me say it like this. Your past does not predict your future. Your past prepares you for your future. And either Satan's going to use your past or God's going to use your past. So if you've been a slave, if you've been an addict, if you've been struggling for 40 years, I got good news for you. It's not too late. Happy New New year, you about to walk into a new season that it does not determine your future, but it develops you for it. Why is it important for us to understand this about Joshua? Because remember, while they were in the wilderness, Joshua had faith. Him and Caleb had faith. They had faith to go into the promise. They had faith. And what they saw in the land was giants. But they also saw greats. But they also had the word of God inside their heart. But only Joshua and Caleb out of 12 spies, only two of them came back with a positive report. Only Joshua and Caleb would be the ones that would last the 40 years in the wilderness and also go in the promised land. What I'm saying is sometimes your perspective might not be welcomed by other people. They will phase out while you phase up. <laughs> they might not see it now, but because you saw what God saw, God's going to bring you to what he already showed you. So, so, but this is important. This is why. Because when you see something that makes you forget what God said, it causes you to miss out on what God has for you. The people went to the promised land. They saw giants. The giants made them forget what God said. Now, I live by this. Don't let what you see make you forget what God said. Because what God said is supposed to help you understand what you should see. Y'all got faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. We walk by faith and not by sight. So you might see trouble, trial, tribulation, but faith says count it all joy. For in that, your faith is being perfected. See, faith allows you to have a different perspective. So Joshua and Caleb had a different perspective and understand true faith can last the test of time. And so 40 years later, we see Joshua walking in where other people have forgot about. 
Uh, maybe, let me say it like this. Here's my point. The first point is you got to release, release the past. You got to release the old. The second point is you got to remember the promises. You got to remember the promises. As we're coming into a new year, some of us are asking God for a new word. I'm about to mess you up now. God, I need a new word. What are you speaking to me for this year? What if God's saying, you didn't walk in what I spoke five years ago? What if he's saying, you didn't walk in what I said last year? So why you need something new when you haven't already walked in what I already told you? They don't need a new promised land. God didn't have to go make another land flowing with milk and honey. He says it's still flowing. Y'all just ain't flowing. And sometimes we're looking for a new word when God's saying, just walk in the word I said. Because his word does not get outdated. And so let me challenge you to not have so much enthronement with new. I want something new. Your iPhone works fine. You don't need the new one. <laughs> Right, but it's like that same mindset. We want new, we want new. And, and sometimes when it comes to God's word, we want something new. But I'm telling some people in here today, if you ain't already did what he said, just go back and, and remember what he already said. You got to remember the promises. See, Joshua had to remember the promises. Could you imagine how frustrated you would be if you came in and said, look, I saw all the grapes, all the pomegranates, and all the land flowing with milk and honey. And y'all fools, y'all going to talk about the giants. Joshua and Caleb said those giants are our bread. What some people see as intimidation, the eyes of faith sees as inspiration. I'm going to say that again because I, I, I want you to have this in June. That when you have the eyes of faith, some people see intimidation while other people see inspiration. Because the eyes of faith looks at the things that the devil would throw at you as intimidation as inspiration. Uh, we got this saying, I was playing, I was playing basketball with, uh, uh, I ain't going to tell you his initial, but his name's Stephen Howard. <laughs> <clears throat> and Stephen, um, Steve, he up there in the balcony, I don't want, want y'all to see him, y'all might want his autograph after this. <laughs> Stephen, we were playing basketball, right? And Stephen competitive, just like I am, right? He might be a little bit more competitive. I'm, anyway, let me keep going. And so, and so Stephen, he, he, he went and shot the basketball. Somebody fouled him, and he called foul, and they said something. He was like, nah, man, it was a foul. He was real cool, calm, collective. And then it got a little bit more intense. And then Stephen Howard said this. I remember this day. He said, let sleeping dogs lie. I said, what? You know, when a country boy started talking trash. <laughs> You, they say stuff. <laughs> I was like, he said, he said, let sleeping dogs lie. I said, no, 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 what is it? He said, don't poke, don't poke the bear. You don't want it. You don't want it. I said, let me get Deacon Howard up out of here. <laughs> and, 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 but there's this element, though, that, that when, could you imagine, could you imagine that, that, that for 40 years, Joshua and Caleb have seen this promise, and these other people said, no. Nah. Every time I would look at them, and I'm waiting for manna, I want to slap one of them. We're going to get man of day. We would have had grapes and pomegranates. <laughs> if you look, did I get too aggressive? I'm sorry. I'm get, my word is authority for 2024, not aggression. <laughs> but, but there's this element that when people begin to hold you back from what God has for you, that, that, should, that should kind of wake up something on the inside of you. That too many times we're allowing people who are not chasing after God to hold us back from God. So the Bible tells us don't be unequally yoked. And we have romanticized that scripture to be about finding the right husband or the right wife. But don't be unequally yoked is also talking about don't be around people who ain't got the perspective of faith that you have. And some people you calling your friends, forgive me if you need to. Some people you calling your friends are your mission field. You trying to share with them your struggles when they need to hear the good news. They are your assignment, not your confidant. And so Joshua and Caleb had to see out of all these people, we're the only ones that got that dog in us. That we ready to go for the promise, all right? So, I got, so, so Joshua has to remember the promise every time he gets weary in the wilderness. But then watch what God tells Joshua in Joshua chapter 1. Back in Joshua chapter 1. 
And he says this in verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot would tread upon, I have given you, said, as I said to Moses. And then he gives them some boundaries in verse 4. He tells them, hey, Lebanon to the Euphrates, to the land of the Hittites, and the great sea toward, um, toward the going down of the sun. So he says, look, all that, that's yours. In verse 5, he says this, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise. He will not leave you nor forsake you. So one, in verse three, God promises his provision. He says, wherever you go, I will give it to you. In verse five, he promises his presence. And he says, listen, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Verse five, he also says, nobody be able to stand against you. And he promises his power. And then in verse seven, he says, only be strong and very courageous, that you, may be, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you to do. He says, my, uh, he says, and do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. And so another promise that God gives Joshua is God's providence and God's prosperity. And then in verse 9, he tells him again. He says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Go. And he promises protection. What I'm saying is, family, that God gave Joshua promises to support him while he pursued the promise. That if I told you, you're going to go into a new year and it's going to be filled with provision, presence, power, providence, and protection, you'll shout about it and you'll be excited about it. But I want to tell you this, the promises, the, the, I mean the provision, the presence, the power, the providence, and the protection are only meant to assist you to get to the ultimate promise to be where God wants you to be. So don't confuse the provision of God with the promise of God. The promise of God is bigger than what you realize. It's not a thing that comes today and leaves tomorrow. The promises of God, this rest, this place that he's calling us to is the hope that does not disappoint. That what he's promising you is not just a new 2024 and a better year. He's promised you that you'll have a greater glimpse of eternity. And that glimpse of eternity is what's going to change us, family. That when we go into the new year, I want you to be the best you. I want you to look in the mirror and say, ooh, I like that. I want all of that for you. But more than that I want for you, I want you to have a perspective of heaven that you've never had before. I want you to have a perspective of the promises of God that God says, listen, I have something more for you. So if the world begins to fall apart, if the world begins to fall down, that you still got a perspective of a promise that is not out of date. Amen? Amen. So you got to remember the promises. And you got to remember the promises. You got to remember this authority that God has called you to walk in. Remember, the question isn't if you have authority. The question is, will you walk in it? I don't know how many of you all have seen the show The Crown on Netflix. Uh, somebody just posted this, and so I'm borrowing it. And they said, you know, they was watching it. And, and when Queen Elizabeth first was appointed and put in as queen, that when they put the crown on her head, she was having trouble holding her head stable and balancing the crown. So she turned to the assistant who was holding the crown and said, can I borrow it for a few days so I can practice with it? The assistant then tells her, Madam Queen, you just asked to borrow what's already yours. Because <laughs> if it's not yours, then whose is it? Oh, somebody already got it. How many of us are asking to borrow anointing, joy, peace, freedom that God has already given you. And you're asking for permission for something that God has already said is yours. And I want to encourage you on this New Year's Eve, as you go into the next year, stop asking permission and put your foot down and walk in the authority that God has called you to walk in. It's yours because he said it. It's yours and it's still going to be there. Is there any Anybody in here that's ready to stop asking for permission and start walking in authority, start walking in anointing, start walking with the mantle that's rightfully yours. If you in here and you're ready to put your foot down, I dare you to let out a praise in this place. God, I'm receiving. God, I'm walking in it. It's mine because you said it. Hallelujah. Huh. 
got to put your foot down. Somebody shout, I'm putting my foot down. I'm putting my foot down. You got to say it with some attitude. Putting my foot down. Hallelujah. Family, this is the last thing. I got a short video I want y'all to see, and then we're going to leave. So you can stay standing. If you want to aim it that long, aim it 30 seconds, I don't think. But I, but I believe this is the picture of many of us as believers in this time right now. Come on, let's turn your attention to the screen. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not drowning. Just stand up. Just stand up. It's yours. Wherever you put the sole of your foot, he's going to give it to you. I'm about to walk in new authority. I'm about to walk in new blessings. I'm about to walk in a new season. I've got new anointing. Put your foot down. I dare somebody to take a step and put your foot down. I know you're excited. And I really need you to, I really need you to catch it. What territory are you gonna put your foot on this year? What, what aspect of your life are you gonna step into it? I know, I know it's been bad for 15 years. But it was bad for them for 40. And then God told him, wherever you put the sole of your foot, he said, if you bad enough to step in it, I'm good enough to give it to you. <laughs> Family, I'm walking in it. I'm walking, I'm walking in whatever he has for me. So I looked at my own life. And the Lord says, Chris, there's some things that you asking me for that I've already given you. Will you walk in it? Will you walk in it? Y'all, I'm not, what they say? I ain't blowing you, I ain't blowing no smoke. Like, I'm, there are certain things in my mind that was difficult for me to believe for because of things that happened in the past. Y'all, 2020 messed up a lot of people. It did. And me being the competitor and fighter that I am, I didn't want to admit how it messed me up. And I kept seeing places in 2023, and the Lord was revealing Stratno in different places that came from 2020 and 2021. As a pastor, it was hard. Other people had hard times too, so I'm not saying my times are harder than yours. But some of us have been walking around with a handicap. And the Lord says, I'm going to straighten your leg out again now. I want you to stand up, get the strength back in your vertebrae. And when you believe again, the Lord kept speaking to me, Chris, there's still dry bones waiting to live. So don't let the bones that walked out on you affect the bones that you're going to speak to. Y'all, I can go down, I can go down a big rabbit trail as a multi ethnic, multicultural church when everything was happening in 2020 and 2021, and some good people decided to split ways, it tore my heart up. And I said, here we are, trying to be a multi-ethnic, multicultural church. And when the world is dividing, we're dividing too. It took me a while to trust that this thing is actually what God said again. The Lord says, Chris, will you reclaim the authority? That y'all are meant to be a prophetic picture of Revelation 21. Y'all meant to be a prophetic picture of Revelation 17 and Revelation 19. Y'all, this church was not meant to be another church. 
Moses, my servant, is dead. <laughs> We're just walking who God called us to be. And I'm saying this because it's not just for me. The word over this house is a word for your house. And if we can walk in the ministry of reconciliation and peace and walk in promises, surely you can in your own life, in your own marriage, in your own family, or whatever your context is. But I'll tell you, I'm tired of believers not walking in the authority that God gave us. So walk in it, family. Walk in it. Put your foot down there. Walk in it. Amen? Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Listen, this morning, there may be some of you all here who have not made a commitment to follow the Lord Jesus as your Savior. We want to give that invitation. No better time than to end the year by securing your eternity in heaven. That the authority that we have as believers come through the authority that is in Jesus Christ. He died for our sins, wiping them all away, and he rose from the grave proving that he's the Son of God. And for whoever calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. And so today, we want to extend an invitation for anybody who's saying, look, I don't want to be questioning where I go when I pass away. I don't want to be questioning if the Lord loves me, if I'm a child of God. You don't have to leave with that question. Today, you can receive him. You can receive him as your Savior. So that's one invitation, to make a commitment to follow Jesus, to give Jesus your heart. Here's the second thing. You know what? Change the order of service <laughs> slightly. If you need to walk in that authority, if you need to walk in that authority, this word is for you. Can you just meet me up front right here? Come on, just meet me up front. If that word was for you, and by you taking a step right now, <clears throat> you, listen, you're not in a rush to go anywhere. You're in a rush to walk in your promise. Come on, come on, I'm believing, I'm believing. Every step you take, this is your, you are walking in it right now. Come on, you're walking in it right now. Maybe you said, look, I don't know what it looks like for me. Just put your foot down, just put your foot down. You know what it is, and we're gonna, we're gonna pray we're going to pray. Come on. Is people still coming? If you're in the balcony, you can make your way down. We, we're going to pray long enough for you to get here and touch and agree with somebody. Hallelujah. Whatever it may be. And here's, here's what I want us to do. Just squeeze in a little bit more because there's still some people coming. If you can link hands, link arms with somebody, put your hand on somebody's shoulder. Because remember, he says, you and all these people. That if all of us are walking in the promises that God has for us, it's going to pull everybody else along with it too. Come on, if you're in your seat, I don't want you to be by yourself. Link up with somebody. Hallelujah. All right, now we're going we're gonna to pray in this moment. So, so you can close your eyes if you want to. And I want you to just begin to name the things that you're supposed to be walking in. Just name it. The things that you are hoping for, that you believe God has spoken. Now, let me tell you, we're not claiming bogus promises is what did God say in his word and how is that now giving us insight to where we are Father we thank you now hallelujah thank you God All right, now take a moment now pray for somebody else to walk in their promise person next to you pray out loud I just believe this stirs up faith. It's not just us. God, I pray for my neighbor, my brother, my sister, to my right, to my left. God, I'm believing, God. I'm believing with them. What the devil meant for their bad, God, you meant for their good. I speak it. I speak it in the name of Jesus. God, I'm believing that they're about to walk into a season of breakthrough. A season of renewal, a season of revival, a season of clarity. You order the steps of the righteous. You did not call them to be defeated. You called them to be more than conquerors. Every place the enemy has tried to manipulate them, tried to harm them, we declare the enemy defeated and we declare your sons and daughters victorious in the name of Jesus. 
Now, Father, every promise that you have for your people, God, we pray now, let it take over us. Let it, let it be overflowing in our life. Open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. We won't have room to receive. God, I pray that we'll be renewed, we'll be transformed. Lord, that we will see you in a greater way. Lord, show us your glory, Lord. We want more of you, God. We want more of you. Let this church be a church that's so desperate for you that nothing else will do. God, as we go into this next year, let this be a year that the church walks in authority, bringing light to dark places. For those who are hurting, hopeless and helpless, God, use us. Use us to bring them into the lands of promises, Lord. Father, we thank you now. It's in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's put our hands together for the Lord.